So what's prompting us to really focus on this is that we're living in a time of great economic and fiscal challenges. All of us, I think, are very struck by the rapidly rising uh, income inequality in our society where so many people are facing stagnating wages, making it very difficult for them to support their families. New Jersey has one of the higher state minimum wages at $8.60 an hour. That's better than the federal minimum wage, and still it's not enough. Even if you were to work full-time, full year at that wage, it's quite likely you could not get your family above the poverty line. Something has to be done. We're facing underfunded public services. During the Christie administration, they were funded so badly. Our schools were funded badly. The state pension system was underfunded. Public transportation was cut back again and again. The result that we know is rising property taxes that a lot of people are very, very unhappy about, rising college tuitions that are pricing a lot of people out of college, threats to the solvency of our state pension system, putting public workers in a very difficult position, and frequent breakdowns in our public rail and bus systems. I can talk about that going into New York. NJ Transit has become, the next announcement is, oh my God, what will this be about? To help us figure out what we can do, we're very pleased to be joined by our local state legislators. We're very, very grateful that they were able to come here on a, on, on a not terribly pleasant uh, night. And an expert from New Jersey Policy Perspective to discuss the following. Raising the state minimum wage and extending paid family and sick leave to all workers. Securing better state support for public education, pre-K through college so we can cut college tuitions and cut local property taxes, raising more revenues to pay for all of this by raising the income tax on millionaires and reinstating the estate tax for the state's over $1 million. <laughs> to discuss these options, public policy options, we're very happy to welcome a distinguished panel. Uh, we have State Assemblywoman Nancy Pinkman, State Assemblyman Robert Karabinchak will be joined a little bit later. Um, if circumstances allowed by Senator Patrick Dyden, and we have John Quinton, Vice President of New Jersey Policy Perspectives. So we have really uh, wonderful people here to discuss these issues. So what we'd like to do with this evening is have some brief opening remarks from Josh Hameson of Ford Not Back and Paul Nadler of Indivisible Central New Jersey. <coughs> we would then like to have remarks from our panel, uh, beginning with John Whiten, who will set the stage for our discussion. And in order to leave lots of room for discussion, we've asked each of the panel members if they could restrict themselves to about five minutes apiece. We then will be opening things up to questions from the audience. To make uh, prime that and get that moving as, as quickly as we can, we've asked you if you could to fill out questions on, on those note cards. If you've got a note card, uh, please you know, put your name and, and town on it. And if you can send the note cards towards the person on the center aisle, we can then collect them at that point. We'll be doing that a little bit later. And we'll also have time towards the end of the forum for any question that might have occurred to you after we've collected those, those questions. So please start thinking about what you would like to ask uh, of, our, of our panel. And Don has got some note cards that you can fill out. So let's hear at this point from Josh Hankson and Paul Nadler. And then we'll be turning quickly to our panel, uh, beginning with John White. And then we'll be uh, asking Assemblywoman Nancy Pinkin and, Rob, and Assemblyman Robert Karabinchak for their observations. So now we'll be hearing from Paul Nadler of Indivisible Central New Jersey. Everybody. Hello. Uh, so I'm Paul Nadler uh, from Indivisible Central New Jersey. We are a very similar group in many ways to Ford and Fact. Uh, we started about the same about the same time, and we, we've uh, evolved. In a, we've evolved into a very similar kind of organization in many ways. Um, we have a central steering committee. We have a bunch of indivisible individual huddles. Uh, immigration, uh, voting rights, etc. Um, and we also have taken our program into basically three basic parts. Uh, so the first part is education. Uh, we have a monthly meeting and we virtually always have a speaker from 
some different organization, a uh, person who's an expert in their field. Uh, we've had representatives, for example, from the uh, National Democratic Redistricting Committee, uh, which is the organization run by Eric Holder to try to uh, uh, control the uh, congressional gerrymandering. Uh, we've had representatives from the Sierra Club and the ACLU, uh, pollsters who specialize in New Jersey uh, voting patterns, etc. So that's our, that's our first leg of our trial. Uh, we lobby legislators. Uh, we frequently have actions, big and small, to uh, uh, show the legislators' offices, to write postcards, to make phone calls, et cetera, to try to pressure them to do the right thing, to take progressive stances. Uh, this, this includes both pressuring people that we disagree with and thanking people that we agree with. Uh, and finally, we are very, very interested in uh, electoral action. Uh, we have a voting rights group that is, that is fairly active in uh, voter registration. We look to surrounding districts where the uh, representatives uh, we think are not as progressive as they ought to be, and uh, we try to get the right people elected. Uh, we'll be very, very active in the coming eight months or so. Uh, in, uh, the surrounding districts, District 7, possibly other districts, uh, to uh, to knock on doors, make phone calls, stuff envelopes, do whatever we need to do to to uh, to try to switch Congress to, uh, to a different color. Uh, again, we have monthly meetings. We have information in the back. Also, uh, we are uh, again we are completely a parallel train to uh, the forward, not back, and we're thrilled. To to be part of this event. Uh, a special thank to uh, uh, to our ambassador to the event, uh, uh, Jennifer Berrier. And uh, with that, I will turn it on to the, to the actual event. Thank you. Good night. So let me introduce our first speaker. John White is a resident of Highland Park and Vice President of New Jersey Policy Perspective, Distinguished Policy Think Tank in New Jersey. They issued uh, in 2017 um, uh, a, a guide, a, a report, laying out fiscal and economic challenges facing New Jersey and what are policy options we might be able to think. Uh, it's a very interesting report and I would really commend it to you. He'll set the stage for us by telling us about NJPP's assessment of the current state of New Jersey's economy and tax system and what we need to do. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for <clears throat> excuse me, turning out on a dismal evening. This week, the Eagleton Poll at Rutgers University came out with its uh, 2018 State of the Garden State Poll. So this is a poll that's chock full of findings about how all of us as New Jerseyans feel about living here. Uh, <laughs> Some of these findings were surprising, some not so surprising, but the one thing that struck me as I was thinking about it and thinking about tonight is that the income group that is the least content with calling New Jersey home is people earning $50,000 a year or less. So these working class or outright poor New Jerseyans were actually 19% less satisfied with living in New Jersey than people earning between $100,000 and $150,000 a year. So I think that's an important stage setter to tonight's discussion for two reasons. One, it reflects reality. Right? New Jersey is a high cost state. Housing is very expensive. Transportation is expensive. And getting by here, even on salaries that would be considered solidly middle class elsewhere in the country, is very difficult. And second, and equally important, it feels like this reality is not always reflected in the public debate over critical economic issues facing the state. In fact, uh, in the Trenton bubble, it often feels like the opposite sort of framework dominates the debate over critical economic issues, and that it's actually New Jersey's wealthiest families and corporations that have the hardest time getting by and that these are the sort of interests that have to be protected, um, either from taxation or from fair labor standards 
or from you know, quote unquote over regulation. <coughs> That's been the status quo over the past few years in trending. Uh, and last year, New Jersey elected a, a new governor who ran on a decidedly different kind of platform, a different kind of approach. Uh, you know, pledging to build a fairer and stronger state, Governor Murphy campaigned on providing greater economic security to the state's working families uh, by raising the minimum wage, by expanding earned sick leave, expanding paid family leave, and other measures. And he also campaigned on restoring some balance and equity to the state's upside down tax code by asking the wealthiest families and large corporations to pay their fair share. So as we move from 2017 when there was an election into 2018 where um, my, my uh, legislators up on the stage actually have to govern, I think there's a huge opportunity for New Jersey to move in a new direction. And I just want to go over a couple of reasons why uh, some of the policy ideas we're talking about tonight are so essential to New Jersey's future. On the minimum wage, as it stands now, about one in every four New Jersey workers is not earning enough to make a living in this state. In fact, 28% of the state's workforce would benefit from raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour over five years. So these are workers that aren't getting by in any way, shape, or form. Uh, in fact, they're relying on state and federally funded safety net programs just to avoid abject poverty. The price tag in the New Jersey budget for these safety net programs is close to a billion dollars a year. So the state of New Jersey and the taxpayers of all New Jersey are essentially subsidizing the low wages of corporate free riders in that case. Um, these workers are older and more educated than ever in history. 92% of the New Jersey workers who benefit from a $15 minimum wage are adults. 65% are working full time. And about half have attended or graduated from college. 26% are actually raising children of their own. And despite you know, what we hear about raising the minimum wage is going to be a quote unquote job killer, uh, we know from decades of experience that increasing the minimum wage can actually help boost local economies. Uh, the proposal that was vetoed by the governor last year, maybe it was actually two years ago, uh, to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour would put $4.5 billion in increased wages into the hands of New Jersey workers over five years. And that's, those are wages that would not be taken to Wall Street or stash in offshore accounts, right? Those, by and large, would be spent locally and immediately, helping to create an economic ripple effect in communities across the state. So that's one piece of the puzzle. So raising the minimum wage, other worker-oriented policies like earned sick leave, wage theft, uh, paid family leave expansion. That's one way to boost working families. Another way is to reform New Jersey's tax code. Uh, New, Jer uh, New Jersey policy perspective has a full proactive tax reform agenda that spans all the major taxes, but tonight the program is kind of focusing on two elements. And both of those elements would accomplish two important goals for New Jersey's tax code. First, it would make the tax system fairer and more equitable. And second, these two policies would raise over $1 billion a year in new revenue they could restore investments in direct property tax relief, public schools, and other essential public services. So the two policies in question that we're talking about are raising the state's top income tax rate from 8.97% to 10.75% on income over a million dollars. This is the so-called millionaire's tax. Uh, this would raise about $600 million for property tax relief and public schools. Now, the state's top rate used to be at this level, but it's been at the lower level since 2010. And as a result, at a time when almost all of the economic gains in New Jersey have gone to the top 1%, the state of New Jersey has left about $5 billion in tax revenue in those families' pockets. 
The second piece of the taxation puzzle that is on the table here in this meeting tonight is to restore the fair and adequate taxation of inherited wealth. So two years ago, New Jersey lawmakers decided to eliminate the one tax on the books that was explicitly created to provide a safeguard against dynastic wealth, the estate tax. Um, you know, the, the, where we got, how we got there, and the death tax, and the death of the death tax is a long story, but really the end of the story is that the wealthiest 5% of heirs in New Jersey got a really big tax cut, and the state of New Jersey lost hundreds of millions of dollars a year that it could be investing in higher ed, or public transit, or other services. So, restoring the estate tax for folks inheriting estates, let's say, worth $1 million or more, a pretty nice inheritance, that would help both fight growing inequality, and it would raise close to $6 billion over the next decade that New Jersey could use to fund a variety of services. So those are just a couple of the you know, action items that NJPD is looking at in 2018. There's many, many others. I think we lived through a, a, a long period of not being able to get important progressive things done in Trenton, and uh, there's a long list, so I'm sure we'll talk about more later. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn at this point to uh, State Senator Deignan. Um Senator Deignan has served in the legislature since 2002 and the Senate since 2016. He serves on four committees, including Budget and Appropriations and the Joint Committee on, on the Public Schools, and is chair of the Committee on Military and Veteran, Veterans Affairs. So let me send the microphone down that way if I can. Hi, um, let me just breathe in for a moment. It's so nice to be in Highland Park with people rational, reasonable, care about each other. <laughs> I don't have to talk about Fox News, that was never an option. But, but lately, CNN is even talked about. Um, today, our president is talking about South Korea on July 4th. Um, Nancy, Rob, and I, you're talking to the choir here. I mean, isn't it nice to finally have a governor who cares about the citizens of the state of New Jersey and is keeping his promises? Uh, his first two weeks when it comes to clean energy, I know he has already yesterday restated his commitment to all of the progressive ideas that uh, he espoused during the campaign. It's like, oops, let me rethink it. But as Bill Clinton said uh, years ago, and it's one of my favorite expressions, it's called arithmetic. We have obligations that we have to meet whether it is, and I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm the primary sponsor along with Senate President Steve, uh, uh, Steve Sweeney of revising our paid family leave. It's ridiculous that people are having children and have to deal with, should they go back to work, can they not go back to work, how are they, the, uh, pay preschool. <clears throat> I was talking to somebody today, she is paying $1,800 a month for her two children to go to preschool. $1,800 a month. This is not a wealthy person. We have, to, we have to attend to the things we care about, and I am absolutely convinced that we will do that. And all the things you talked about, the millionaire's tax, although I believe this is an opportunity for us to actually revise our entire tax code, not just tack on the extra 2% on the millionaires, but actually give relief to the lowest income folks that need it the most. But all of the things you talked about, it is doable. We're, in this year's budget, we're approximately seven uh, billion dollars short. That sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot <clears throat> based on what's taken place in the past. And I have to call specific attention to your mayor, who is as effective and reasonable an advocate as anybody I have ever met. We were just speaking this afternoon, uh, which he has, he has brought to my attention over and over again. Uh, Governor Christie, like so many other uh, accounts, Reagan, the uh, utility account it used to come back to the cities, to the uh, uh, boroughs, and, and to the townships. I'm proud to say, as a result of your mayor's urging, I am going to be the Senate prime sponsor of the bill by Dan Benson to restore that. That's only fair. Thank it's you. money to be done. I think 
maybe we can take some questions. I know Rob and Nancy want to say some words. I'm under a little bit of a time constraint. My brother and sister, I drafted them to come here. We just came back from the hospital from visiting somebody, so I'm under a little bit of a time uh, schedule, but I want to hear some questions. So let me turn it over to Nancy. Who, yes. by the way, I have the two best running mates in the state of New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before we turn to uh, uh, State Assemblywoman Nancy Pinkin, could I remind you that we're going to be taking questions. If you have questions, uh, please put them on the cards that we've distributed. If you could print out your name and town, and we'll be then collecting the questions at the end of uh, uh, Assemblywoman Pinkin's remarks. Um, if you could, why don't you send them towards the center, uh, center aisle or towards the end person, and we'll be collecting them. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll be. Uh, so, um, at this point, could I, I'd like to introduce State Assemblywoman Nancy Pinkin. She has served in the General Assembly since 2014 and is now Deputy Speaker Pro Tempore. She serves on three committees and is Chair of the Committee on Environment and Solid Waste. So thank you very much for, please, for coming on a very, uh, on a not terribly pleasant evening. It could be the Assembly Works, right? And I, I will say the only people that shovel the township corners of snow for all of the residents is Highland Park. So, you know, no other town does it. Highland Park is really unique. But I do want to say hello to Senator Schluter, who's in the audience. Senator, can you stand up? <laughs> Senator Sch Schluter is retired, but he, he's a Republican, and he is known for being the voice of truth. He would always stand up in the legislature and say, um, what nobody else wanted to say, but really had to be said and and uh, had to be acted on. So uh, he uh, worked with Gordon McGinnis a lot, and they frequently had similar ideas about things. So I respect you so much for coming, Senator. He's retired now, but we're happy to have you. But you know, my, my feeling is um, it's not just a tax issue. You know, we talk about the taxes, and we have to change this tax, add this tax, or add that tax. But we have a we have to be more efficient. We were one of the greatest states in the country. We were leaders in so many things, and now we're second to um, Illinois, and you know, on the list of you know being close to going bankrupt. So we have to start thinking outside the box. And one thing that the mayor does here is she has been thinking outside the box. We have to look at ways we can be more efficient and ways we can make the state affordable for everybody. We don't want to look around and see all the license plates or hear our peers that are saying they're leaving the state. They, I don't care what their income is. They're all saying, you know, they just don't want to do it anymore. And we have to relook at that. We look, you know, when we just talk about the governor, we have the most uh, powerful governor in the country. We talked about the governor who went out. He spent $42 million on his way out the door on ads for addiction. And while that's a crucial, crucial issue, that money could have been used for rehab. He spent $12 million on the election for um, that we went through the special election and, and that was wasted money, all of this money on travel. So we have to start thinking outside the box. What can we do? You know, I went to uh, NYU for graduate school and we talked about efficiency and effectiveness. That's what we have to drill down on. That's what I'm going to try to do on my time in office. I have to say, what can I do to make a difference? And whether it's as chair of the Environment Committee, you know, I serve on the Health Committee. I did serve with, worked with Senator Vitale once on a program where we said, you know, kids weren't getting insurance. How are we going to get them insurance? So we said, we're going to create a novel pro pro program. We spent six months retooling Medicaid. They were sending out cards once a month to their members, doing it in the mail, costing uh, 17 million dollars. They were had a 17 page application for Medicaid and we got it streamlined down to one page. We sent the card only once a year and we took that money and reinvested it in getting kids what was the original family care. So we have to start taking that action on all these things. We worked with the mayor to try to leverage, you know, had to leverage with Rutgers to get them to provide experts for us. One of the first things I did as environmental chair was get their expert to help me with the, the expertise that they have so that we can make, you know, not be spending money on environmental things that are costing us, if we talk about lead in the water, lead in the, uh, lead in the air, you know, 
that's costing us so much more on the money we're spending for special ed for kids in the school. So we have to look at all of these things. We start to start to go back to square one. And we have to really start to re-leverage things. The mayor was talking about this tax that you know was taken, the the you know legislation put it into effect, and then the legislators legislators took that money back out again. We can't live like this anymore. And it's not it's it's just the fact that people don't People, the individuals, the businesses, the towns, the elected officials don't have faith that we can be as efficient and effective as, as we can. So we have to go back in every little thing we do and start to be more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman Pinkett. Um, we'd now like to hear from um, State Assemblyman Robert Karabinchak. Uh, he has served in the General Assembly since 2016 and is Deputy Majority Whip. He serves on three committees and is Vice Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Again, uh, this is something that I just talked about, and uh, 
absolutely. This is this is a small piece of, a, of something that should happen and should have happened, and I think that will happen with this new governor. Why are you I think the reason that Senator Sweeney has uh, said that he's concerned, he's concerned about the impact of the federal tax changes and how that's going to play on the impact on the New Jersey taxes as well. And I think we have to take that all into consideration. And again, I think we have to look at all of our efforts to be efficient and effective. I don't believe any one thing is going to solve our, you know, we have a huge budget crisis. We are in a huge deficit and we have to, um, we have to relook at how we're, how we're doing it. We have to make sure that everything that we commit, every dollar to, is fully used and fully effective. Thank you. Um, another question that was asked by uh, someone in our audience is, Opponents of the tax on inherited wealth often falsely imply that nearly everyone in the, in, in, in the U.S. must pay it, or in New Jersey must pay it, um, and misleadingly calling it a death tax. Um, instead, it is more accurately termed the dynasty tax. Um, some call it the Paris Hilton tax. Because it affects only a very small percentage of the states, and it generates a very substantial amount of revenue that could fund public education, infrastructure, and health care. Um, given that uh, situation, um, do you support a tax on um, restoring the estate tax, or do you think that would be not a good idea? Uh, whoever would like to pick that up? Well, I don't know about, about you, Rob, but I know that Pat and I were both supporting a change in the estate tax. We had many residents in our district that wanted to see the estate tax increased at the time because they felt, especially many of the seniors, they felt that they were going to move if they didn't have that change. Uh, we were surprised that it went as high as it did. So I think there's a, a, a balance to relook at that and see how, how that may be adjusted. Uh, yeah, on, on this particular issue, uh, I believe that we should be equal to what the feds have their taxes on, on, on the state. Yeah, I agree with Rob. We got a great link to the feds. Uh, it was too it was too low before. It was it, you, anything over six hundred thousand dollars was a taxable event. That was just too low. If you own a house and you have an IRA, you're over six hundred thousand. So everybody agreed, but to eliminate it was ridiculous. So to, to relink to the to the federal is the way I would. That's what I would, and I think that's what. Which is what? What is the fact? What is it, five million? I think it's five million. It just got raised to double what it was before. Well, I, I, to me, the five million was a more realistic. It's 11, 11 million uh, for an individual. Wow. 11 and 22 is obviously too much. I don't think I didn't, I didn't realize that. But there's that, that, that past, the past both houses are good. See, that's what happens when I'm not watching the news. But okay, the, the five million to me sounded like a million over six Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came up uh, concerns the raising the minimum wage. Uh, Governor Murphy has proposed raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour. Note that if the minimum wage were adjusted for inflation since the federal minimum wage was first passed, the minimum wage would now be more than $20 per hour. Given these points, do you support a minimum wage of at least $15 an hour for all workers without exceptions? Yes, I, yes, I um, do uh, absolutely believe it should be $15 an hour, except for that last part, with no exceptions. There are circumstances that need to be carved out. For example, summer camps, and this is agreed to by everybody involved. If they did not utilize kids in the summer working in the camps, they would have to shut down about half the camps in the state of New Jersey, which would actually affect lower income people more than anybody else since they utilize the camps. So there should be some minimal carve outs, but very, very minimal. Do I, in general, 98% agree with $15 an hour? Yes. Yes, I like the $15 an hour, but as Pat said, the carve outs are, are becoming a bigger and bigger issue in the debates. Uh, as, as Pat said, there's carve outs now on the agricultural side for seasonal work. There's carve outs now that are going to be talked about for, for municipalities for their summer work, for Board of Eds for their summer work, for, 
for the, where the kids come in and help out, where they get paid approximately $10 an hour. The carve-outs, from what I'm hearing from other groups now, there's more that they want carve-outs for. So at some point in time, where do you stop with the carve-outs? My opinion in the caucus was, if you're gonna go $15 an hour progressively over the next four years to 15, it's not gonna be 15 tomorrow. So don't, don't think that's gonna happen. If it gets voted on, it's not $15 tomorrow. It's in 15 and four years. That's, that's the way the bill is written. So don't, don't believe that it's four years to get to 15. The issues are the car outs. Because when you talk to the other legislatures in the caucus room, and they're from all over the state, there's every area has a different issue and a different car out. So at some point in time, you have to ask yourself, what are we raising the $15 minimum wage for? If this group wants a car out, that group wants a car out, this group wants a car out. And there's people that aren't, their voices aren't heard in track. The, the people that are on small businesses, a Hallmark store, a deli, a car wash. Think about this. When we say yes to $15 an hour, all of those rates go up. Everywhere. Person cutting your lawn. It all happens. So, in my opinion, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it across the board. I personally don't like car routes, but that's what that's my opinion. I think if everybody's going to be fair, it has to be fair across the board. You know, people are nervous about this. Some people saying that, you know, I'm a policy person by nature. I always like to take a survey of what happened in other states, what, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And some people saying that when they did it in Seattle, when they did it in some of the other states, when the minimum wage went up, then some of the other things that people were eligible were knocked out and some people were worse off. So it's, we, want, we don't want that to happen. We want to be careful that we are not harming small businesses. You know, when the economy was teetering for a while, just kind of struggling back, people were concerned. And uh, I think that's what has given a pause so far, but I think, you know, all this will be negotiated with the, uh, you know, who's going to be carved out, who not, and, and, and you know, I, I, I'm sure that we will be going forward with it with, under the government. Thank you very much, uh, Assemblywoman Lincoln. Um, one last question, and then we'd like to throw it open uh, to the audience. What we'll be doing is, is putting the microphone stand over there in the center here, so uh, walk up and, and uh, please ask your question. But uh, the last remaining question of those that were handed in to us is how would you support passage of paid sick time at the state level? This is, of course, something that um, Governor Murphy has recommended. Um, and I guess the question would be um, how would you support passage of his recommendation? For sick time, the Again, it's all the negotiations. One of the sticking points of the bill previously of the sick time was some of the exceptions that some of the groups were not willing to make any changes. And one change is uh, paid time off, for example. The bill does not have any allowance for paid time off. And I mean, I, 30 years ago, I worked for a company that we paid time off. You got 30 days, you used it as it, however you wanted. And if you were the person that uh, always went to work no matter what, never took a day off, never pulled in sick to go to the Eagles parade. Uh, you could, uh, you know, you were not penalized for being that person that always went to work and showed up. So um, I think that's really some of those nuances are, are um, the things that have to yet be worked out. I don't, I think they need to incorporate that. Uh, most of the businesses, actually the large businesses, support it because they already give those sick days. So I think it will be helpful, especially for um, young parents that have children that have to take their kids to the doctor, have to be out sick. They need that time to be uh, to be off. But when you look at the flu epi epidemic right now, our policy of having people go to work no matter what was making people more people sick rather than, and hurting everybody else. So I think we really come to that time that we'll move on to this issue. I agree with uh, paid sick time, but I think the negotiations are going to be extremely difficult because they're going to, there's going to be some level of a line saying that after you employ so many people, that paid sick leave is going to be there. And the people below that were smaller businesses that may not be there. These are the, the different discussions that I've had already 
where that's going to end up, I can't tell you right this second. But I know the governor's for it. I know that there's a lot of people that want to see this happen, including myself. This one, along with uh, family leave, I have difficulty even understanding why there's a debate about it. I mean, <laughs> pushback by employers in the beginning. Now they actually, to a large extent, are embracing it because they realize it actually retains quality employees. I mean, you can't have an employee losing their job because they're sick. I mean, I think this is still the United States of America, right? Sometimes. To me, this one's here. That's just me. Um, I realize there's one last question that was here that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, we'll be asking people if they'd like to come up and ask questions. Has there been any talk of increasing state aid to municipalities? It is my understanding that state aid has been flat for the past eight years. I guess this has been an issue of you know, the, the position municipalities are in in terms of being able to yeah, finance we actually the had, We actually had what they call the retreat, what they call this thing, uh, where both the assembly and the senate were together. It's the number one priority. I'm, I'm both assembly speaker Coughlin's play. Uh, Senate President Sweeney's played, play, and I know the numbers played. So absolutely positive. And I hate to run, but I but I got to. Uh, I I it was really a struggle to get here, but I just this was just too important to miss. Please excuse me for leaving early, but you know how much all of you mean to me, how much I appreciate your input, and you know my number. And, and these two guys, they're they're good, and, and we think virtually alike on everything. So I just want to thank everybody. For well, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you for coming. We also appreciate the time that uh, Assemblywoman uh, Pinkin and, and Assemblyman Herr Benchak are devoting and John White, and we appreciate their willingness to stay on and answer questions. So, uh, with your permission, could we turn to the questions people will be posing coming up from the audience? And when you come up, could you uh, come up here to the microphone stand and just Clearly state your name, where you're from, and try to make your question as concise as possible. Thank you. difficult to maintain unions which currently exist. Uh, so what is the assembly going to do and, and mitigate? A lot of states are consider, considering mitigating measures. Uh, I'd like to know, and maybe you know as well, Mr. White, what's, what's possible or likely in the jury? Well, I'm shocked <laughs> that the Supreme Court is going to take that position. I mean, I, I was hoping they wouldn't. I mean, we just did have big success on the uh, uh, voting and on the overturning the districts in, in uh, Pennsylvania, so, you know, I don't want to make that position until it happens. My, you know, I find it fascinating that, you know, there's nothing we can do, I mean, maybe, I don't know, we could take, New Jersey's a pro-union state, basically, so, you know, we're already doing a lot for unions, at least on the Democratic side, and since we have a Democratic governor and Democratic Assembly and Senate, I can't imagine us being anti-union in any way, but, you know, I do think the unions have to also do more to express to people why. I mean, when I think back, you know, I was a nurse's aide originally, and, uh, you know, I made very minimal wage and worked a very, very labor-intensive job, you know, lifting heavy patients in a long-term care facility. And I had friends that, you know, made a lot more money than I made even when I, you know, moved up in the ranks. But So I think that 
why people don't support unions more when they're the ones, when you look at Walmart, who made people work two part-time jobs and told them they couldn't get benefits. When you look at all those different things, I don't know why everyone's not supporting a union. That, that's my position. And I'm not saying that to put it on the unions, because I, you know, I, we are a per union state, but I think that, you know, we're looking at the biggest income divide ever between CEOs and and the workers, no matter what level. I mean, we, we look at, you know, we talk, I'm sure we're gonna talk about healthcare, but you know, Aetna is gonna be merging with CBS, right? And so, uh, their person, their head CEO, just from that merger alone, is gonna make like $500 million, and people can't get an x-ray or a doctor's visit, so why would we not be supporting unions even more when that disparity is growing every day? <coughs> Well, I hope you're 110 percent wrong. Um, you have to remember what unions, how they were created in history. Look what they've done for for so many vast groups of people. Um, just because you're not in a union, you shouldn't be hurt, and you should be able to do anything that you want to for your quality of your life and work anywhere you want. I think that that's part of the freedom that we have in this country. If you want to join a union, you should also have that same freedom. I believe that it's going to be up to you and what you want to do. There's skilled workers, there's the teachers, there's the police, there's fire, there's, there's the health workers. There's so many. In fact, there was a group um, that was just in my office, and they were part of the United Airlines. But this group was the ones who packaged up the food, cleaned out the planes, and they're not unionized. They're the only group left that's not unionized. And they were, went through the process and talked to all of those people that, that are in their group, and after a certain percentage, you're allowed to unionize. Well, United suspended three of those people that were asking to, the groups to unionize, which is the labor laws, not just in New Jersey, but across the nation are phenomenally strong. You can't do certain things. And that's one thing you can't do. Um, that's why I would be amazed if the Supreme Court said that the whole nation has a right to work. I would be amazed. So I'm absolutely pro you. Um, I'm pro you can do anything you want. That's what makes America great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll send you some information. Yes, I'll see after. Uh, you know, consolidation of services between towns. You know, how much of that do you think is necessary, or you know, uh, you know, what's your opinion, your your view on on that to kind of get costs down? Is that a real way to do it, or I know what your view is? Are you saying you support getting costs down? That you're so yeah, like like if you, you know, for, you know, I guess people say you know taxes are high, uh, you know, property tax, and I mean, is, is I, I, I hear a lot of talk about consolidation of services between towns and things like that. Is that a realistic? Some people, you know, well, you know what? This is like being the parent of the child. And somebody's got to say no at some point, and if we don't say no, we can't have everything we want. You know, it's easy to say we're going to put more money into this, more money to that. We don't have any more money. We're broke. So, but let me say, I will say this: Middlesex County. What I decided the other day was that you know, Middlesex County, we we started meeting the legislators together, and we meet now in a caucus. And that's how we got Assemblyman Coughlin elected as the Speaker of the Assembly now. We have been meeting with the mayors and with the um, Middlesex County freeholders, and we've been trying to leverage our assets. We have a triple, B, a, triple A bond rating in Middlesex County, and we're going to start looking at We already do a lot on shared services, and I know the mayor's been working a lot on trying to partner with other towns on things that we can be similar and that, that they can work together on so we can bring the cost down by doing that and and we have been pretty successful with that we've really been trying to uh, strengthen our economic development to 
leverage our assets in Middlesex County. We're the center of the state. We have many assets. We've been trying to work with Rutgers to get them to share their assets with us and, and to be able to leverage that to attract businesses here so that we can have a lower tax rate and, and we're going to keep doing that every way we can. Rob and I are working on a bill for streamlining permitting which would, you know, if we can make people feel confident that whether they're a resident applying for a permit and they want to get something done quickly without a lot of red tape, we want it to be, um, follow the, the regulations that we need to make sure that everybody's safe and that we're, you know, doing things right, but we want to streamline it and do it. I say get with the 90s. We want to be, we want to modernize and be efficient. So we do believe that we can get the cost down. And we have to get the cost down. It's just, we just can't keep getting more money. We just don't have it. So we have to be, and we're doing that now. We're going to keep doing that. It's our mission. I agree with everything Nancy said, and certain levels of consolidation is absolutely important for, for all the towns. It's, it's finding the right process where that everybody can agree to certain things. Yeah. That's the Talk issue right now. Because there's not enough, in my mind, there's not enough communications. I mean, this mayor here talks to everybody, which is fantastic. But yet there's other mayors that they just do their, their thing in their own town and you know, outside of the perimeter of their town. And do I believe that we should be legislating that? I, I don't know. No, I think I would rather see that freedom happen. Um, and, and nobody wants to sit there and raise taxes in their own town. And they shouldn't be raising it. We, well, I don't want to raise taxes in this state. So, so how do you how do you get everybody to have consensus and compromise to do the right thing? That's the issue without making laws to make it. Yeah, not laws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I, what I like to say, the answer is yes. And I agree that I think there has to be a lot more talk, not just in our county, which is doing great, but across the state. Can I have Thank you. One thing to that. Sure. Uh, so. You know, consolidation, municipal or county or school district, whatever, is something that uh, it's talked about a lot. Um, it's certainly worth exploring, but I think because it's talked uh, talked about so much, it's kind of held out there as if it could it has the potential to turn New Jersey from a relatively high cost, high tax state into you know a super low tax state, which obviously it's not going to do. I mean. One of the reasons our tax rates are high is because we have excellent public services, we have the nation's second best public schools and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I think there is some money to be saved from consolidation. I think everything should be on the table, but um, I think there are segments who, uh, I'm not saying this is no, you or anyway, but like. Low, just not as, you know, higher than other places, but not as high as it is now. Right, it's certainly worth this part. Thank you. Keep in mind, uh, why don't we take uh, maybe one last response and move to another question. I just want to add one last thing. You know, it's like your credit card. It all adds up. Every little thing adds up, and you have to start somewhere. We have done consolidation, Princeton consolidated, Lambertsville consolidated. It's not just necessarily the towns, but services that we can do that we can be more efficient. It's not, we just can't keep saying, you know, it can't be done. It can be done, and we're going to find ways to do it. Just one last, one last statement about this. I, I believe that every town is unique, and every town has its own identity across this, this great state of ours. This consolidation, I don't believe, should be with town merging in with another town. I think that the, the, the most expensive items in that town should be looked at as consolidation or shared services or something else. Don't know what it is right this second, but I think that every town has their own unique identity. And that's why people live in that town. Good evening, I'm Melanie McDermott. I live in Highland Park, and I have a two-part question I'd like to address to the whole panel. Um, and that is, what do you think um, is the most strategic response New Jersey can make to the recent changes in the federal income tax? Um, how can we come out ahead? I know some various forms of subterfuge have been proposed. And, and linked to that question was something that I have not given any thought to before. So when Senator Diamond said, this is an opportunity to redo New Jersey's tax code. Um, that caught my interest because I don't know a great deal about our tax code um, other than the reliance on property taxes. So if you have any thoughts about what opportunities this 
rethink might open up for making a more equitable and effective uh, New Jersey tax code, I'd love to hear that. Thank you. All right, well, we have to refer to any CPAs in the room. That's like above our pay grade. You know, I think that, uh, I, I know that the mayor had mentioned to me, people had talked about the idea of, you know, can we uh, be a nonprofit or can we donate part of the money and then take it to keep our tax credit that way. I mean, when I first heard that, I was like, that's not legal. But, you know, I, people are looking at ways, now, but, but, but there are a number of states who are looking at that. And they're, you know, we don't have an answer yet, but you can guarantee that we're certainly looking at it. And uh, Rob and I are not necessarily looking at it, but people in the state, we have a new treasurer, they'll be looking at it, the governor's committed to looking at it. You know, the CPAs who do work on tax, you know, we're not the expert in everything, we rely on experts, so, you know, they're gonna come forward and any idea that we can, you know, use, we're gonna, we're gonna certainly try to do it. I know mean, this year people tried to pay their taxes early, which was a great thing, but that was a one-time thing. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to, you know, overturn, look at every possible avenue to address that. We pay, you know, you, our partner states in the Northeast pay more to Washington than we get back already, even before this. So, you know, we're not gonna just take it laying down. It, it is critically important to New Jersey. I agree with Nancy. There's the forensic CPAs and the CPAs are all looking at this. And unfortunately, there's no one answer because everybody, just in this room, is, has a unique piece to this and how it's going to directly affect them. So there is no one shot answer. And I, I don't believe there ever will be. And as Nancy said, yeah, well, every dollar we send to Washington, we get 61 cents back. New York gets 75 cents back. That's New York. So we we have to not, we have to you know we have to do something for New Jersey to to, to fight for our money to come back. What about our own tax code? Our own tax code. Like I said before, I'm an optimist. I like change, and I think that we should be relooking at stuff that was established here from years and years and years ago. No disrespect to our forefathers, but it's time for a change. By the way, one thing I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard this also, but I just want people to be aware of, is that people are saying that right now, people, after January 1st, people are getting more money back in their paychecks, and that they don't want people to be surprised at the end of the year that you might have had too much taken out because that might have been a strategy that the federal government was using. So to check with your person, whoever your advisor is on your finances or your accounting or your payroll person at work to make sure that what's being taken out is not going to be too much and then you're going to end up owing money at the end of next year. Uh, so there's kind of multiple components of the uh, federal tax plan. There's what has gained the most attention in New Jersey is the state and local tax deduction cap. And as you referenced, there are you know, ideas to do a workaround there. Uh, the charitable donations thing, the Treasury Secretary has already said that probably not be accepted by the IRS at all. It's not a bad idea to try it, but it doesn't seem like it has legs. I think the focus on the state and local tax deduction, while important, also obscures a bigger piece of the tax plan, which is just this enormous shift in tax rates for corporations. I mean, they're getting a rate cut of about half, uh, and those cuts are permanent. Uh, the smaller tax cuts for individuals are temporary, and the entire thing blows a huge hole in the federal deficit, which means this year, uh, what the House of Representatives wants to do is start really cutting back on spending. And that matters not only for services across New Jersey, but it matters for the state budget, because we rely on these federal-state partnership type of programs, SNAP, Medicaid, and all of these things are on the chopping block. Um, in, in Speaker Ryan's kind of agenda for America. So I think the state needs to both be looking at the salt issue, but also figuring out how can we recoup some of the windfall that, that corporations are getting in order to protect New Jersey from the worst that's still yet to come. Not to layer on even more, but a lot of the tax credits are going to companies out of the country as well. So it's, it's not like it's helping U.S. companies. Okay, so could we uh, take another question? Thank you. So.
Welcome, Mr. Mayor Midler. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here tonight. It, it's it's um, always great to hear what you all have to say. Um, I just wanted to iterate uh, uh, something that Senator Dyckman mentioned earlier before. Um, it is true that I do bug him once a week um, about many different things, but my job is to make sure that our residents here in Highland Park are safe and also to do whatever I can to stabilize taxes here. And so uh, it was a surprise what he mentioned before about the bill that he's co-sponsoring. Um, I just wanted to let you all know the impact if that legislation passes. Um, there's, what he was referring to are the energy tax rebates. Um, these are funds that were collected by the utility companies that are supposed to go back to municipalities um, and uh, in order to uh, make the process more appealing to the utility companies, there was an agreement that the funds would, throw, uh, would flow to the legislature and then from them back to the municipalities. So just so you know, um, that, that money, um, and, and I have all the respect in the world for you, so please forgive it wasn't me. Us. I don't say. It wasn't you, it was before you. That money was hijacked by Trenton. So just to give you an idea of how much money we're talking about, Little Highland Park is owed well over $5 million in energy tax rebates. That's just Highland Park. Now, if you take that and think about our taxes for schools, fire, police, library, et cetera, et cetera, we, the tax, the, the real estate taxes are really where it all flows down to. So I, I, I was thrilled to hear that today from Senator Dykin, and I hope that also in the assembly, I can, we can count on you guys to help champion that through if it does get into the assembly. Um, so, so that was one thing. Um, what's, the, the na what's the name of the bill that Diane is? Um, he, he didn't mention the name of the bill, but it's energy tax rebates. Okay. Um, and and um, I'll get that information, and we can talk more about it. But you know, so yes, your organizations. It would be great to continue putting pressure um, on our uh, legislatures to try to get some of that funding back. Uh, my second question. Um, so the governor is interested in legalizing marijuana um, for recreational use in the state. Um, and I was wondering, if that happens, um, will there be any kind of tax benefit to municipalities that might host a distribution center? Or, uh, <laughs> just looking for some fun. <laughs> You know, I think this being worked out now, um, I don't know what's going to happen. People definitely, uh, I'll say in general, there's agreement that marijuana should be decriminalized, right? That's step one. The second step is, should it be legalized? You know, we have a huge opium problem, so it's something that people are looking at. Many people feel that the, opium pro the opioid problem is not related to the marijuana issue. So how it would it be distributed? So, you know, we've been having this conversation. I don't know about you, Rob, maybe you have in commerce, but we've been talking about is it going to be through the vape shops, through the current alcohol licenses? That's all currently in play. Now certainly if they have, you know, there'll be some kind of licensing. For, and one of the other uh, feelings, by the way, with the legalization is that the, we would control the product so it wouldn't be laced with other things which is causing some of the product some of the problems but um so that's all still we don't really know how it's going to be worked out but i'm sure it'll uh you know it's going to be distributed from somewhere and that will if it's a licensure through the towns probably will go through abc which is the uh, alcohol distribution license Do you have more insight on that rob but I believe that if any town that will allow it, and it has to be an ordinance that has to be allowed by the town to either distribute it or to grow it, there's two different two different licenses that are going to come out there. Do I think that that host town should should come from that? The answer is absolutely yes. All right, because there's other towns that won't. And when, which you, is say, when you say grow, you mean for 
professional and not in your backyard. Well, absolutely. Right. No, it, it's going to be regulated extremely, extremely tightly, and, and oversight is going to be unbelievable. So, so it's not actually a joke because, like, under the medical marijuana laws, in some states, people are allowed to grow a small amount themselves. But New Jersey does not allow that. That's why I say about the growing in the backyard. So, so how far down the road do you think the legislation is on that? You know, I, there's, there's talk about, there's, well, there's going to be a lot, a lot of conversations, like I said, a lot of stuff, even more. So years. What we're talking about. No, years. It's going to be, it's going to be, even if it gets passed this year, yeah. the licensing still, that whole right. process has right. to happen. That's right. And that, that growing cycle, from what I understand, it is uh, four to six months. So if we won't see any revenues from this, even if we pass it this year, to maybe the end of 2019. Or 2020 is when I would really take it. But again, yeah, back to your energy credits, absolutely afford the bill. Absolutely. Because that, that'll help every town that was that money was just taken away from. Them. And it's been flat for I don't know how many years now. What, 10? Yeah. Maybe 12? Yeah. Flat. Maybe even longer. And that's, it wasn't fair at all. And those rates have gone up. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Midler, for raising these questions. We have still uh, a number of uh, questioners still left. Let me also mention that when questions were brought up to from the audience to, to be read off, there were a lot of them that were uh, more came in than we had anticipated, and I didn't do justice to all of them and didn't read uh, perhaps more than a fraction of them. So if you raised a question and we didn't ask it, you haven't had an opportunity to ask it since, uh, accept our apologies. We'll try to get this down better next time. Um, could we then uh, have our, our next questioner come up? Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Alberto. Yo soy miembro de la organización de New Labor. Nosotros queremos un bill estatal que regule las agencias de trabajo temporal porque abusan de su poder y no nos dicen a dónde vamos a trabajar, cuánto nos van a pagar, no nos dan entrenamiento de salud y seguridad. Sufrimos accidentes en nuestros trabajos y la agencia no tiene un seguro de compensación para los trabajadores, no tienen un fondo por si se van en bancarrota y las vanes que nos transportan llevan exceso de personas y no es justo si esta propuesta existiera para regular a las agencias de trabajo temporal, ¿lo apoyarían? Um, so this is Alberto, uh, he's from New Labor's organization in New Brunswick. And this question is basically about the existence of a statewide bill for a temp agency. If it exists, we support it. It's basically going over right here. Sure. Uh, they, they abuse their power, right? Uh, when people go out to work, they don't know where they're sent. Um, they don't give any training in workplace health and safety. People get hurt. A lot of these agencies don't have worker comp insurance. Um, there's no bonding of them in the event that they go bankrupt. Uh, I'll just add that there was a case in New Brunswick where an agency uh, was caught by the state defrauding uh, the workers' comp insurer, and the workers were out of pay for basically a year. Uh, and all this stuff isn't fair, right? And the vans that are, people are going in are over capacity. So if there is a law, uh, we support it to regulate some agencies and the workers' conditions. <laughs> We had a legislator, uh, Jillian Skokie, who was uh, elected in this district as a Republican, and she herself had a temp agency. It was quickly unelected. But the issue, you know, this is a complex issue about, um, really, it goes to the core of immigration. Whether or not people are documented or undocumented, whether they're allowed to work for an employer legally or illegally, and, uh, you know, we would have to take it. I haven't heard of any bill coming forward on it, but, you know, I think it comes to the core of the question on documentation, which is what we're all struggling with right now. And I, you know, we're very um, thankful that Reverend Seth and the uh, community, both Metuchen and Highland Park, have been uh, addressing our um, residents that we've had here, and we're trying to issue talk dreamers and what to do about them, but this is basically the core of the discussion right now. Um, to get to your to your point about <clears throat> temp agencies, there's there's 
extremely strong labor laws. That's number one. And then there's also insurance laws when you talk about workman's comp. If you're going out on a particular project and this temping agency is acting as your employer, because that's the way I understand it, that agency has to be able to afford your insurance. God, God forbid you get hurt on that job, whatever it may be. I don't know of any job that is out there that you don't have to have insurance. If there is, please let me know. Well, I think that's the issue with the ten agencies in the first place. Well, if, if that's it, I'll let my chief of staff look into it. Because if there's an exemption for some reason, and that's one of the reasons I don't like exemptions or carve outs. I'll look into it and I'll pass a bill that, that every temp agency has to have the same qualifications as an employer. Because that's exactly how they're acting, as an employer. Well, we have uh, also Rob Angelo, a senator. <laughs> Rob Angelo, a senator who's from East Brunswick and is a union uh, person by background. That's what's his father. He is now going to be the uh, Commissioner of Labor, so we can discuss the issue with him. There is laws that do exist on the books in Massachusetts and Illinois around uh, regulation of temp agencies and the conditions that temp workers face. It's not really a, a, an issue about documented or undocumented, rather some of the problems that exist. And a lot of times it's finger pointing, so no one wants to take responsibility when there's a temp agency uh, when it comes to the conditions of work. So we hope to get something going along the lines of what's already out there. Hopefully that's something that well, address the issues. Again, I always say, you know, we try to learn from the other states as well, so if you have that language, you can bring it to us. We'll share it with uh, Rob, the new commissioner, and, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, one last question. Hello, I'm Renato Cruz. I'm from the organization. And as we're talking about economic issues, and this is an economic issue, how are you supporting or not uh, the bill for driver's licenses for all in New Jersey? Well, I was a co-sponsor. <laughs> I'm a poor, I'm a poor. Thank you. <laughs> See, there, there are 10,000 bills that go through in a cycle, and about a couple hundred get signed into law. But these are all very complex issues that we're facing every day. Rob and I, you know, our staff are there anytime you want to call our office. We're always here to listen. These are not things that. You know, they're all very complex issues and we spend a lot of time working on them. We really do try to take as much input from the residents to find what things are going to be good for you because we are the representative of government. We're here to serve you. So, again, I would thank you for the forum and we're, we're here to answer any questions at any time. Thank you very much. Um, it, before we move to a closing, and I, you're taking us in the very direction I thought we might want to go, is. Are there any last observations you'd like to make before we close? And I also want to thank you very much for taking the time to come to entertain. These questions are often quite complex and hard to know precisely how to respond. But I was wondering if you had any last remarks you'd like to make. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, this was an absolutely eye-opening event. I'm happy to see this. This is good. This is good. This is communication. This is what I, I like. And I hope there's going to be more. So again, thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, if you're interested in working with Forward Not Back or Indivisible Central New Jersey on the economic justice issues we've talked about tonight, we'll be around for a while. Could the members of our huddle put up their hands again just so that you can recognize them? Okay, so you can see anybody you'd like to talk to back there. Uh, there are also sign-up sheets at the table near the exit to the social hall. And uh, so we hope this will be just the beginning of a continued conversation among ourselves, with our state legislators. We very much appreciate their invitation to continued conversation, and we very much appreciate the time you take to, to come talk to us. Thank you very much.